everybody, I'm Debbie Montgomery Johnson, founder of the nonprofit The Woman Behind the Smile, and your host of Stand Up and Speak Up, a show that is about each and every one of us. Many of us have something, something we're hiding, something we're ashamed of, something not through no fault of our own or through our own making we keep hidden, and that in turn keeps us hidden from each other and the world. Good people go through terrible situations. Wise people know when and how to let it go. Everything that happens to us helps us grow, and while it may be hard to see it right away, the most important thing to do is to change your perception about your circumstances. Regardless of what your personal experiences or traumas have been, this showcase series is designed to ignite the light in you, as well as providing safe harbor, education, personal growth, and resources so that no matter where you are on your journey, you'll have the courage to move on when you're ready. Stand Up and Speak Up features ordinary people who've been through extraordinary situations and struggles and found the courage to step out from behind their smiles and speak up about their experiences and the lessons gleaned from those experiences. Everybody heals at a different pace, and we recognize that. So come on in, have a listen, and enjoy the ride at your own speed. It's a beautiful day in paradise. And I say that because I'm down in South Florida, and today is a beautiful winter day in paradise. It started off about 61 degrees, and we're going to probably go up to a mid-70s. But I wish my friends in Canada, whew, get your warm blankets out. It is nippy up there. And my special guest is coming to me from Pennsylvania, and she's got six or seven shirts on. So, girls, it's time to move to sunny Florida. It is beautiful down here. So today is actually my very first show for 2022. It's a brand new year, a brand new series, and I have a really special guest. My special guest is Heshi Siegel, and Heshi's coming to us from up in Pennsylvania. Madam, are you there? I am here. I'm so glad you're here, Heshi. And, and it's interesting, I say this about a lot of my guests, that we haven't ever met in person, and I don't believe we have, but I was just sitting down writing how we know each other, through the internet, through connections, and it's Awakening Giants. It's Women's Prosperity Network. It's CEO Space. And you're the wife of one of my new favorite people, Horner Berger. So, well, he say, feels the same your, way. So your, it's like your, you two have this mutual admiration society going. I, I should say, you're my special guest. He's your husband. <laughs> You and I had a very interesting discussion the other day because we're like, well, what are we going to talk about? And I'm like, oh, you my word, the hour is going to fly by. There's so much, Heshi. But I start the day off or the show off with your background because I know there are a lot of people that don't know who you are. So can you give me an idea of where did you grow up and what was your family life like? Oh, my gosh, that is really general, and that is really big. So I grew up, I was born in Atlantic City, New Jersey, down at the seashore, and I returned there for many summers. I moved mm, five times before I settled in Trenton, New Jersey, for a long time. Um, My father was in the Army, and we just moved from place to place, and um, moving from school to school, and I guess when I was in third grade, I was coming home in tears all the time. That was, that was the, um, the reason that we finally wound up in Trenton, New Jersey. I was living in a small area called Hamilton Township and Bordentown, uh, that area, and it was very anti-Semitic. And we used to be, um, we used to try to stay out for the holidays, and the school, or at least my teacher, always gave tests on the days, and she told me that there was no excuse for my being out, and so I failed the tests, and there were no makeups, and I used to come home crying. I mean, I was hysterical, and it took me two years to get my parents to actually move, and then when I moved, uh, my life kind of changed. I was in in a very different kind of area where um, everything, everybody was appreciated, and I loved it. And so I started flourishing in the new area. And it's kind of where I learned about my own self-determination because my parents were not religious, but I think because I had gone through so much anti-Semitism that now that I'm thinking about it, it was probably my roots of fighting for the underdog because I'm very involved in inner city I go to Africa with Werner. I take care of kids around the world. 
And I now that I'm thinking about it, that might have been the original impetus for me to really take care of those who are, um, I don't know, those who are, who's, are looked down upon because of their color, of their religion, of their beliefs. And I, I, I you know, Debbie, I'm just like thinking about it. That that was the springboard of who I was to eventually become. Did you have brothers and sisters? One brother. One brother, yes. older or younger? Younger. Do you ever have to look out for your brother? You know, I didn't because he, I was brought up in this puritanical whatever, and if any of his friends, and he was four years younger than me, if any of his friends came by, I remember a night where I used to live across from a canal and a pond, and we used to go ice skating, and my brother uh, would bring his friends in, and I had my friends there, and some of his friends started cursing, and he'd like read them out saying, you can't curse in front of my sister. So, no, you know, I guess because it was a guy, and he... He just was the one that stuck up for me. There you go. Well, that's always good. Um, yeah. And it's, it's interesting that, that the boys would do that, but they do. And uh, so when you walked into when you walk into a room, if and Warner and I talked about this yesterday, if there are people around in the room that are you know speaking a little bit vulgar, do they stop because you walk in the room? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They they know. I just I don't. I don't like it. I don't think it's necessary. I I actually don't tolerate it. I um I I find that that's just not necessary. It doesn't make the world a better place when you're vulgar. So I stop that if somebody's talking about someone. Um, my friend Sean Duperin has done a, her doctorate on gossip, but she does good gossip. So if someone is saying something that's not the way it should be, or just talking about someone negatively, it's time to stop that and cut it off. And it's actually part of what I teach. So I'm, I'm pretty careful about that. I just don't, I don't like it. I don't appreciate it. I don't need foul language. I'm, you know, there may be a time and place, but it's not something that I believe in. And so I've always been called Miss Goody Two Shoes. And you know what? That's okay. Maybe that's why I like you. <laughs> I think we've got a lot in common. I had that too. We were, you know, we get called Pollyanna and all these things, but yep. it's really important that. Uh, I mean, I, I thank thank your dad at, for his service in the, in the army. Um, I was an Air Force. I am an Air Force veteran. My kids are, are military, but I remember uh, my one job over in Germany. I worked for an Air Force colonel, and I was a captain at the time. And he called me and he said, Deb. I have a young lieutenant that is coming in from Korea, and I want you to clean her up. And I'm thinking, oh dear, what does this mean? <laughs> well, she came to us from Korea, and her mouth was a gutter. And I, oh. I, after some time, because that is definitely not me, and she knew that. But after some time, she, she did come around, and we had some really good discussions. And I said, you know what? To fit in, you don't have to sound like them. Because she was working right. with some really tough guys, and I said, you don't need to sound like them. And uh, I, I hear that from my husband. He's in the um, he's underground utilities construction business, and a, a lot of the language amongst the workers is very, hmm, not me. And as soon as <laughs> I walk in or walk nearby, it's like, ooh. And on the phone, it's a riot. If they find out I'm in the car with them, I'm really sorry, Deb. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to say that. I don't understand it, but I don't. I don't like those words either. So, and that's part of what we do. And I think you know, our, our walking in, it's really important that people know who you are by what you say, what you do, and how you act. And exactly. That's what I love it when I when I see you, and you're so passionate about things. Uh, but life has not always been easy for you. No, so, it has. Let's go back a little bit, uh, and kind of, I want to find out, Hashi, what is, you just said right now that perhaps that incident about the anti-Semitic um, schooling might have been one of the things to get you to protect kids, but what actually happened to you that really cemented in you that there's an important part of us that needs to protect kids? Well, I guess when I was younger, I became 
the family toy. I was living in my grandmother's home. So before I was six years old, my father, my uncle, and a couple of my cousins um, had their way with me, and it was like everybody ganged up. And it stayed with me to an extent that I, I didn't realize until, well, years ago when I started doing therapy because it has actually colored my entire life that men would abuse me in this way. And so I, I really am a protector of if I see something wrong or I see a child is being mistreated or a woman because I'm really – very much a woman's advocate. I I love spending time with women because there's a different vibe. You know, I love having men in my life, but it's not the same as having women. But I can identify with when someone's been abused, especially a woman. I, I often know it, and certainly a child, because I've been there. I know the signs. And uh, to this day... I, I know that it's something that is deep inside of me that is still causing me pain. And I have gone through so much, so much counseling. Um, when Werner and I met, I was still at that point where I totally did not trust men at all. I mean, it just was not a, it was not a good thing. So I, you know, of course, I've learned to trust him since, but it, it just, it has definitely colored my whole life. It has been a really hard trial because of underneath, it stays there. It just has not gone away. And I've had lots of people say, all right, I'm going to help you. And some of them have gotten through. I have a, a life coach. Um, I had a kind of a life business coach, and I worked with the two of them, and I got through a lot. I've had a healing coach um, it just last year. There was someone that came to visit us, and because of COVID, I have not had anyone um, in the house. I don't allow people to come in because I'm high risk. And I went through an exercise with her, which really gave me the tools to hide, not hide, um, just push away. Like, I don't need that anymore. So maybe for a while I did need it, but it has definitely affected everything I do. And so I don't want children to go through that. I mean, it's like, I don't want children dying too soon. I want their knowledge to out there. I want them to have the tools for what they need. I, I had, when I first started my first nonprofit, it was all about character education and teaching kids the possibility of who they could become, of wanting them to live into who they could be. And it, it was an amazing time. I loved it, right out of money. And when I started my second one, it, my, my Kids Better World, it was going to be the same kind of thing until Werner and I started traveling around the world and I saw kids in third world countries. And I thought, oh my gosh, how can I be teaching character education when kids didn't have food in their bellies, they were dying from contaminated water, they didn't have a roof over their head, they didn't have clothing, they didn't have an education because they didn't have supplies, they didn't have anyone to teach them, they were, you know, the girls were out fetching water, they couldn't have an education. So all these things added up to, oh my gosh, I skipped a lot of years there. <laughs> it just like <laughs> added up to who I am today. Um, I am very much a children's champion and, and the underdog. It's like everybody who seems to have less and could have more, I'm there standing at that person's side. So at, one po at what point in your life, though, were, I mean, my show is called Stand Up and Speak Up, and we all put on that mask and we hide and, and want people to think we're fine and that our life is perfect. At what point in your life could you really accept what happened and stand up for yourself and then start speaking up about it? Because that's a very vulnerable thing, uh, any kind of abuse. Uh, you know, a lot of times the victim hangs out in the victim mode or uh, has a very difficult time coming forward. You've done it in a wonderful way. I, I've done a number of things to stand up and, and 
speak out. It's like if because I have ADD, and for those who don't know, those of us who have ADD have short attention spans, but when we become focused, we become laser focused. So I would probably have to to map off six things so you would be the one remembering. And by the way, when I talk about ADD, there are so many people that have it that don't even know about it that when I begin my 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 own weekly show, I usually talk saying, I have ADD, whatever I start saying, I'm going to come back to it. I just may not come back to it in the order in which you may hear it because um, I want people to know that it's okay just to be who you are and to own it. So when I first, uh, one of the things was actually because of anti-Semitism. Um, I remember in college I started standing up because, oh, this was, this was an amazing, see here I'm going back. I know when I started crying when I was in third and fourth grade, I stood up and said, I just can't do this anymore. I have to move. I don't want to live here. And I cried until we actually moved. When I moved to that school, I remember it being a very white school and two black kids moved in. And I went and I befriended them. And I just started talking to everybody. And I said, make them your friend because they're not like everybody else. They're, and I didn't know very much at that point about anything with race relations. And I remember... Cheryl, who was the female of the two, um, I just would say to people, just make sure she feels comfortable because we owe that to her because I knew what I had been through. When my parents told me that I couldn't go to, uh, or they weren't going to drive me to services, and here I'd gone through all this anti-Semitism, I said, okay, I'll walk. And I walked in the rain and the snow, and it wasn't a short walk because I was determined that I was going to do that. Um, when, when I was in college, I, had a, um, I, had a, I was going to major in Spanish because I loved the language. I was very, very good at it. And my Spanish teacher was a Spanish lit teacher, and she said to me, um, not to me, to the class, all Jews have horns and tails. And I stood up and I said, excuse me, I'm Jewish. I don't have horns. I don't have a tail. And you're going to be fired. (coughs) And that week she was fired. Because there are things that have to be explained. So I don't take, I, I just don't want to take anything from anyone when there is a way that you can teach and explain what might have been going on during that day. But Not these days. It's like saying someone's stupid and everybody believing it. Well, you know, maybe they don't have the same education, but I always want to stand up for that person. I ran a program called The Speak Out, and it won a lot of national awards, and it was teaching people who – it was teaching people about our community and the different organizations in the community, and I wanted people to speak up, to defend what they were doing, to do all of these things that others may have sat back and not done anything about. So I formed a huge organization, um, and I had programs running on a monthly basis. Debbie, I have more. Do you want a few more examples? Well, no, I, I'm finding this. I, I'm taking notes. And first off, I made a note that I, I, I think you're my newest rebel with a cause. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I do have one that was pretty amazing. Um, I, was teach, I was doing a couple of young leadership program in my community, and at the time, so this gives away age, which is fine, Kissinger was in charge, and there were about, uh, about 20 couples in the, in the program, and I was running it, and I used to bring in speakers every month, and it was a fabulous program. I was teaching young couples to be um, part, of the, part of the community and to become leaders in the community. I wrote a letter to Kissinger telling him about the program we were doing, and I was arguing with Kissinger's thoughts on what he was saying, and the group got really annoyed that I would 
put down that this was our young leadership group because they thought they were going to be blackballed by the government. Mm -hmm. And so I went through a really hard time. I was on Valium. I was on whatever it was. It was not a good time, and I stood up in front of the group, and I was shaking. And there were two guys in particular who just felt that there should not be female leadership. And I said, you know what? I'm really done. If you think that you can do a better job, and I'm shaking right now because it was, it's so vivid in my mind. If you can do a better job than I can, then you just take over. Three months later, the whole program fell apart, and the, the whole community lost an organization that was training young leaders because they didn't want me to be in charge, number one, because I was a woman, number two, because I had the nerve to speak out to the government about something that I thought was wrong, and as leaders, they were hiding, and leaders don't hide. Leaders, they, leaders have a vision. They take a stand for what's right, and I've, to this day, I have always realized that what I did at that time was the right thing to do. And that's a very, very important thing, because if we sit back and we don't take action on something we believe in, then everything else around us is going to fall apart and never return to be the same until some other rebel or leader has the nerve to come forward and just say, I'm taking a stand, this is what I'm doing, and I'm not going to take it any longer. It's interesting, though, I, when I say rebel, sometimes you, you think that uh, you know, someone's very um, an activist, but an, an aggressive activist, and you're not. You do stand up with power. And have you found over the years that, especially with women, that with listening and education and cooperating gets you a lot further than coming in like a bull in a china shop? Oh, absolutely. If you just think about it, if you're having a conversation with someone and you bark back, then you haven't really listened because you were thinking about what you wanted to say next. You weren't really listening to the other person. And, and in fact, today, later on, I'm going to be talking about this listening thing. If you don't listen, you can't learn. And so it's important to hear someone out so that you do have the ability to talk back. And you can say, let's take this down a notch and let's listen to each other and you stand in my shoes and I'll stand in your shoes and see if we can see this through a different lens. That's, that's perfect. Yesterday, uh, Werner and I were talking about that and true leadership. You know, sometimes leaders manifest as bullies or he, the other side of it was someone very shy. Uh, and I think he and I both felt like many times we'll walk into a room in kind of a, I don't, shy is not the word. For me, it's more introspective. I, I don't walk into a room and want to make a big splash. I want to look around and take it all in, see who the characters are. I might get intimidated by someone that is an apparent leader. It's usually the one that's the loudest. Uh, and mm -hmm. then I realize that that person may not have an impact for me. Uh, and that might ne not be the person that needs to be the one for me. And so I will probably stay, stay away from them. Um, but we can make a difference in a quiet way because that, that's that strong silence sometimes. And, and we talked about this too, about how we have two ears and one mouth. Sometimes yep. we need to listen a whole lot more than, than speak up. But in business, Heshi, you've done a lot of things. You, you are the connector. Um, but it hasn't always been positive, right? So we're going to, you brought something up the other day that I didn't know about. And because I work so closely with people that have um, been impacted by financial fraud, mm -hmm. can, can you know where I'm going here. Can you tell me um, about working with people that you trust and having that trust ripped out from underneath you? Well, Unfortunately, because I'm so trusting, I've had it ripped out from under me several times in many different circumstances. So when someone tells me something that's going on, I really have to listen to see which one of those stories 
I can bring back to tell them because sometimes a story is the only way someone will realize something. So um, in, I think it was 2017, I... Uh, invested in some revenue-producing websites. I had met um, this person through an organization where I had made a ton of connections, people I really respected. This was someone I remember walking in, and we were all sitting at different tables, and there was a leader at each table. And um, I can just use a first name here. So Ken was at this this table, and I was just mesmerized by his brilliance. I mean, he had answers for everything. And I just, when we were supposed to switch tables, I didn't switch tables, and that's not like me, because when someone says switch, I'm switching because I want to meet new people. But here, I was just really interested in what he said. It was like I couldn't get enough of, of what he was saying. And so I, I just continued learning from him and I trusted him and then it turned out he was having an event in Philadelphia and I had not yet in I don't I don't remember exactly it's not clear at the moment if I had invested by that time uh, but he had an event and he needed I, I had gone to him and said is there some way I can help you because the fastest way to make a friend is to go help them not to help them because you think you're going to get something, but to help them because you appreciate who they are and what they have to offer, and you want more people to know about it. So I went and I said, is there a way I can be of, of support to you? And he said, well, I'm having an event, because I told him where I was from, and he said, I'm having an event in Philadelphia next week. And I said, um, well, how many people do you need to to have come. And he said, well, if, if I could get an extra 10 people, that would be great. And I went, <clears throat> oh, I can do that. Um, I said, I can get you a lot of people. 10 is like, you know, it's like nothing. Well, he then trusted me because I had over 70 people show up at that event, and it was just 10 days later. And it was because I was a connector. People listened to, you know, if I said something was good, then it was good. They knew it because I would never promote anyone who was not, I didn't personally think was good. And I had no other experience with him at that time. So when he came uh, and he saw, because I, I said, the, he said, is there something you want? I said, yeah, I would like those tables at the front to re be reserved for the people that I'm bringing. And he did that, and it was great. And then he had another event in Atlanta, and by this time, I'm already speaking on his stages because he realized that I was a speaker and that I could do something I said I would do. In Atlanta, I, I got a lot of people to come to his event, but I didn't um, – it's like I don't live in Atlanta, so I didn't know as many people. I'm in Philadelphia, so I knew a lot of people. And he was upset that I didn't bring as many people as I did in Philadelphia. And shortly after that, there, there was a strained relationship. But in between that time, and I think it was in Philadelphia that I first purchased the, the, the websites, and I, something just seemed off. The website had done very well in the beginning, and I had um, remortgaged my home, and I had cashed in my IRA. I took my savings that were you know, my investments that were bringing in money, I took everything out and I took it all and I invested with him. And then in January, no, February, uh, no, December, it's going to get my name, my, my date straight here, December of 2019, the SEC had taken all of our sites away because we were guaranteed income, and 550 of us invested with this person. And my guess is over half of them came to him through the same organization that where I had met him, and all of us lost our money. And it turned – I don't think in the very beginning 
that he meant to really scam everybody. But then one day, one of his employees was on the phone with us, and he said to me and Werner, you know, you need to take a better look at what's going on in the back office because there could be money that you're not getting. And neither of us really thought about that. And we thought, oh, well, you know, it'll come. And then we had some very good months where there, were, where there was money coming in. So at that point, we, were, we got a second site. And the sites were $200,000 sites, so they weren't insignificant. And, I mean, literally, I cashed in everything. I took a loan out at the bank. I mean, it was a... It, and, and I was a nervous wreck doing it because I had to get this done and then, then they had to stop work and then they had to go on until more money came in. And it was really a, 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 a frightening time. But when the money started coming in, and that's what, that's what lures us into doing more, I thought, wow, this is really great. And, and Werner had said to me, would you sell the site? I'm going, oh, no, no way. I would not want to sell the site. And then when the SEC came in, and I realized there was absolutely nothing. We're, we're never going to see a penny. I mean, it's in court right now. Last night I looked to see if I could find anything. He was indicted in 2000 and uh, he was indicted in 2020. But there was, there's, there's nothing there now. I mean, no one knows where he is or what he's doing I don't think he's in jail. I've reached out to people that I've trusted to, who know him well, and the answer, one of the answers I got is, well, I'm curious, but I don't want to look back. And now I don't trust that person. And that person I met at the same place, I'm not going to mention his name, but he promoted Ken as well. And so I've lost my faith in that whole situation. Um, it's been, you know, there was, it was, you know, think about it, trouble just putting food on the table after that time. And just two weeks after all this happened, I had neck surgery. And so I was in the hospital. I wasn't able to move. I couldn't do anything. There was no money coming in because the money had disappeared. And so it definitely changed my life. And just now... It's like we're looking at new opportunities, but when you go through something that devastating, and you would know, mm-hmm. it's like I didn't tell anybody in the beginning other than the other people who had been scammed, but then when people asked me to do things or for Werner and I to do things, we just couldn't do them because the money was gone. And I don't usually talk about not being able to do anything, but it, it, has, it has been devastating. It has not changed my attitude about not allowing others to, to suffer. It's like, it's kind of like what you've done, but I don't think I'm, I'm really not quite there because you have really turned that corner and I'm still turning it, but I well, won't give up. It's new for you. For me, it's been nine years. Yeah. So I've it had is time. So. It, it takes time to understand. And it's, You've lost. I mean, it's that, I hate to say it's a shiny object syndrome because I've had financial uh, friends that are in the financial services business that have been taken and really beat themselves up uh, until they realize, like, okay, so what can I learn from this? How can I uh, help others not get taken? And it's, it's, it's a time to really understand that there are good people out there. And mm-hmm. they want the best for you. And then there are others that appear to be good and may not want what's best for you. And unfortunately, that's, you know, they look a lot alike. I mean, I just did a show last week. It was the top uh, scams of 2021. And impersonation scams where they impersonate, you know, they they clone websites. They clone businesses. And Mm -hmm. and it really hurts people. And and you said something, and it brought up, it's called chasing the money. It's like gambling. You know, you get a little mm-hmm. bit of money in and then you want to chase it because you're like, I'm going to get more, I'm going to get more. I have, I have a nephew that, that is a gambler and I'm thinking, you better stop. You know, first off, pay your taxes. <laughs> and uh, it's always like the next time, the next is going to be bigger, the next is going to be bigger. I'm like, yeah, but you could lose everything. 
And right. we can all lose everything in a minute because of people we trust. And I mean, I did. You know, you know my story. I lost, I lost it big, um, and I didn't have that money in my in my bank account. And you guys didn't have that money. I mean, when we sold IRAs and and remortgaged homes, those are substantial financial uh, assets. And yeah. it's tough at our ages to recover. So you're going to get angry, my friend, <laughs> if, you, if you haven't already. Um, but does anger really help in recovering? Well, it, Maybe for it, ha- it of course, it it, yeah, you can let it all out. I don't know that I'm, I can say that I'm angry. I'm disappointed in being duped. I'm, I don't think I've gotten the anger out. I mean, I, I don't, I, I, I don't know because the anger, it's not going to help me. I, I, if I'm not going to be proactive about it, I mean, it's gone. And, I don't. I don't want to have learned this lesson the hard way, but it's gone. And there's when when he's in jail, I will feel. Um, I don't know. It, it's like someone who does something wrong. If they stay free, then something's wrong with society. If if someone's guilty of something, then they need to pay for it. And I feel that he needs to pay for this, even though he didn't start that way. He got greedy. I mean, he even was paying for his kid's education, his mortgage on money that came in. So the anger is not going to help because you can't think through the anger. You just, you, you can't think when you're angry. It's like, don't, don't take it out. You know, I say, don't, when you're angry, don't make a decision because you're in the valley. You're not on top of the hill. So anger doesn't, Anger doesn't help. You can be angry, but you can't you can't work you can't work with the anger inside. You've got to be able to come to a place of peace and level headedness. And I can say that because I'm working through it. It's understanding what happened, why it happened. I mean, we were looking for investments. We were looking for a way to not make a half a percent return on our money. And then we were given this, you know, this is a guy who came with high recommendations. Was We watched his brilliance in action. I mean, just totally brilliant, had an answer for everything. And it wasn't as though he was really smooth. But it's kind of like there were a couple of signs. And so when there are signs, people need to look at the signs. Don't, if it's too good to be true then it may be too good to be true. My kids and Werner's kids, or at least one of them, one each, did not want us to do this. And we both looked at it, you know, it looked good, uh, the return was good, and so we did it. And when the second one came along, because the first one was making money, we went on to the second one. But the anger... You just can't work through the anger. You've got to come to terms with this is what happened. This is what I need to look for. I'm not going to do this again. It's like investing in courses. Werner and I have taken hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of courses. And we can't do that now. And we won't do that now because we, you know, we've come to realize, and I think everyone gets to a point when you come to realize if you've done enough, you've got to use what you already have because you don't need to get more knowledge unless it's in, of course, a specific area, like you're learning something new and you need this knowledge to learn that, to be able to do that. But you get to a point where, what you already have needs to be used. And, and we are starting something new this year in 2022, but we get to pick and choose what we want to do, and we're going to control it. There isn't anyone that's going to take anything away from us because we have control over what we're going to do, and we can help a lot of people do the same thing. But anger, 
you can't work through the anger because you can't see straight. And, and from experience, uh, actually I was in Dallas a couple of months ago in court uh, supporting a friend of mine who had been scammed. The scammer was caught, uh, 80 something victims. She was the only one that stood up in court. But there was something very empowering for us to see that it was a young man um, held responsible for what he did to so many victims. And, mm -hmm. it, you know, n none of us will get that money back, but just the, just the resolution and seeing how thorough the FBI and the prosecution was in building the case based on speaking up, you know, and this is a thing, if something like this happens, you have to report it because you may not get resolution, but in general, someone will be held responsible. And when I left there, for me, it was like my scammer had been put in jail because I know mine probably won't. He's over in Nigeria somewhere. But it represented to me closure that we caught him. And it was only because my friend reported along with the other people that reported. And like this, you'll not get that money back necessarily. Maybe some of it. You don't know that. But you can't live your life waiting for that money to come back. It's like, what do we do now? And that's what I love about you guys is that you're not letting it stop you. You might listen to the kids a little bit more. I mean, I had those pink flags, I call them. I had my kids mm -hmm. say, Mom, don't, don't, don't. And I'm like, but I'm the adult here. Leave me alone, you know. And I mm -hmm. eat my, you know, my words later on and apologize. Um, but as Warner and I talked the other day, some things happen to us, but they happen for us because mm -hmm. we will be able to use those going forward. So our hour is flying by, Heshi, and I, that was an important part of your story that I needed to hear again and that my audience needs to hear because it could have stopped you guys. You could have hidden under a rock and we would have said, well, what happened to Heshi and Warner? You know? But you know, I I do want to add one thing, which is a really important lesson, and anyone listening to this really needs to hear this. I ordered in November some. I ordered. I, I never ordered. I've never ordered really clothing from a catalog from an ad, but I ordered some things from the internet because they looked fabulous. When they arrived, they it was complete deception. The sweater that I thought I was ordering was just like a shirt with a pattern on it. <clears throat> and it was like uh, maybe $100, $150 worth of stuff. And um, it wasn't what I wanted. And I called immediately and said, I'm not going to accept this. I called the credit card company and I said, this is not what I ordered. And so the thing that I would say to everyone is, if you order even the slightest thing and it is not what you expected, don't sit back and just say, oh, you know, it's $5, it's $10. Werner and I don't let those things go by now. If something is not what you ordered, you need to take action because if you don't take action, then someone else is going to be duped. And then more and more people go and do the same thing and it leads to more and more deception. So if even the smallest thing happens, like when your newspaper doesn't arrive, uh, you know, it's 50 cents. No, you call the newspaper and say, I want a credit. So whatever that happens to be, don't sit back. That's because it. That's it. It's like take action. Absolutely, because inaction, it, it, you know, it allows that scammer to go to the bank. Fifty exactly. cents over a million people is a lot of money, and mm -hmm. so it may not seem much to you, but it is so important. And uh, last week's show is report, 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 report to the FTC, report to anyscamnow.com. I mean, we've got to speak up about this, otherwise it's not ever going to stop. And the scammers bank on that. They think, oh, people aren't going to talk. Well, exactly. You know, $1 scam or $2 million scam, it's still a scam. And we have exactly. to talk. And I'm looking at you and Warner. We have educated, well-trained people, and we all get duped. Someone's mm -hmm. going to take us at some point in our life, and it's what we do with that. And that's what you guys are doing. You're making a difference. We're going to pivot right here really quick. Okay. Because I love what you're doing 
in Africa. Explain to everybody your passion and I want people to listen to the show that when I interviewed Werner about him going to the mountaintops of Kilimanjaro and Everest, uh, that took you guys back to Africa. So what are you doing when you go to Africa? Because this is fabulous. Well, the first the first trip we had, we were actually going to get married at the top of Kilimanjaro, and Werner kept saying to me, it's cold up there. And I went, nah, like how cold can it be? And he said, it's cold. And I made the night before we left, I made him go with me to buy a leotard and ballet shoes. So I would be put this under my wedding gown. I mean, we took our stuff up there to get married. And then I got altitude sickness and and he he i he said to me you're going to go down i didn't come up here to go down and i said the same thing to him and when we were doing machu picchu but here i did go down after the third day and it was you know and we got we got married the first time that's a whole other story um when he came down but what happened was because I went down, I had a chance to do the other part of what I was going to do. I, before I went, I figured, okay, I, I want to help children while I'm there. I asked around. I found an orphanage that, uh, that a group of 800 kids. There were 400, but when they told me there were 800, they said I can't take care of 400 when there's 800, and I actually bought clothing for 800 children. And so I got to start working with the children there, and when I said to Father Aloise, if I could grant you three wishes, what would they be? And the first thing he said was clean water. Mm. And, I, and then I said, oh, okay, I'm going to do something about that for next year. And that was... That was the beginning. And he said to me, oh, you're not going to come back. I said, yeah, if I say I'm coming back, I'm coming back. He said, no, people say they're coming back all the time and they don't come back. And he said, well, that's not me. When I say I'm coming back, I'm coming back. And this was in 2010, and Werner and I have gone just about every year except because of COVID. We haven't gone now. So what we do now is when we go, we do a safari, then Werner um, leads the climb up the mountain, and when he's gone, I go to the schools and the orphanages and um, the hospitals, and I work with the kids. I bring them uh, clothing and school supplies, but the most important thing is bringing them water purification systems so that they don't die, because 5,000 kids under the age of five die every day from drinking contaminated water. And what if the child, what if Nelson Mandela or Oprah Winfrey or um, John F. Kennedy or whoever it happens to be, what if they had been that child? Then the world would not have that person to change lives. And that's my feeling. Every child is equal. Every child deserves an opportunity, and if we don't consider every child our child, not our biological child, but we have, I think, a responsibility for all of our futures to be a humanitarian, to be that person who cares about what happens in the world. And if we don't take care of our children, some child would have been the one that discovered something that one of us needed to have to cure us from some illness, from something. And so I've become, see, I'd be, I'm already passionate about it. It's like I, I, I go into the schools. I went to the Nelson Mandela School for the first time, I guess it was four years ago. And one of the young men that I consider my son now in Africa got me in there. And I went and again, and something happened earlier in my life, and the same thing happened here, is are they going to accept me? Because a Caucasian had never been in there to teach anything. And I was the first. And my only worry was, were they going to accept me? And oh my gosh, it was the most beautiful experience. And now I've become friends with the principal, and I go back, and I am accepted. I'm accepted because of who I am and what I'm doing, not because I'm white. And well, and you said they call you Mama Heshi. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wherever I go, I'm Mama. Mama um, Heshi. Yeah, so, and I Heshi. love it because 
when Werner's on the mountain, it gives me time to do what I want to do and to be with the kids, to get down on the ground, to work with them, to read to them, to play with them, to teach them about the values of clean water and not to be using single-use plastic. I actually fill my my purity bottle with with extra mud in it shake it up and let them come to the front of the room and this is something that i teach everyone because leaders go first and i say and i just say to them i don't think any of you would realize that i'm going to think that i'm going to do anything that would harm you but i want to volunteer to come up oh one boy one girl i always do two i don't do just one of one or the other and they say the people who go first are the people who win because they're ready to take a chance to take a risk and so the first two kids who come to the front of the room and drink from the bottle and the, uh, the others watch it go up the straw and see it be absolutely pure clean water and the bottom of it is just completely brown those are the first bo- the first kids who get clean bottles clean clean they get their own purification system and what I do is the kids in Africa make bracelets for me I buy them from them I come back home and I get donations for them and that's the money I use to buy additional filters to replace the filters that they already have so they actually earn what they need to do to get more filters well it's terrific how can people watch what you're doing or or join or donate where can we get hold of you there the, they can go to kidsbetterworld.com because that's my um, that's my kids site. I would actually like people to get in touch with me personally. Something seems to be wrong at the moment with my Kids Better World website. Or reach out to me on Facebook. That's that's probably the best way. And to tell me that they are coming through you. Um, my Heshi Siegel one is pretty much it's full. But I started a new one called guess what, Heshi Siegel Africa, and they just have to tell me they're coming through you. And if they come through you and they purchase that way, if they purchase two uh, purification systems through me, then a child gets a third one for free. And I'll give it to them for my wholesale cost because it's so important for me to know that they can use these bottles. I want to add one thing. Yeah. I have these bracelets. In fact, I'll put a picture up on Facebook. I have these bracelets that the kids make, and people can um, make a donation for them, and I'll, I'll tell them what it is. And um, that's money that goes directly back to the kids. And then they make more bracelets and they get more filters. So I use that money, and it's a, you know they can make checks out to Kids Better World. And there's, it completely goes back to the children. It gives them money that they can um, live on and eat and have, and, and have their clean water. So it, it goes to a great cause. Well, you're building a generation of young entrepreneurs. Yes. It's great. It's great. And if we start young, then that's a whole new generation. So I yeah. applaud you for what you're doing. And uh, like I said, I, I think you and Warner are terrific and you're role models for me. I'm really grateful that we've connected and whatever we can do to help your cause uh, with the children, the Kids Better World, uh, we're going to put it out there. So thank you th- so much, my friend. I can't believe the hour has flown by. You're a wonderful person, and I look forward to um, doing some more things with you and Werner going forward. In the meantime, thank you so much. Have a, have a happy new year. Be safe. Be healthy. Good luck with your, your lawsuit and all that stuff. Uh, I hope there's resolution to that. But in the meantime, we've learned something from you that good people, well-educated, well-trained, big-hearted can be taken and are taken but don't let it hold you down don't let it keep you under a rock stand up speak up and be a source for power and for good thank you for all you're doing my friend appreciate I so appreciate you having me on and thank you for what you do because you are making a huge difference well I appreciate you thanks for listening to stand up and speak up we are dedicated to encouraging you to remove the mask of embarrassment and being your best self If you've been a victim of a scam or cybercrime, please visit againstscams.org for assistance and guidance about options and recovery. SCARS, the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, is an incorporated nonprofit crime victims assistance organization based in Miami, supporting scam victims worldwide. 
If you can, please make a small donation to help the victims around the world receive the help that they need. This episode has been sponsored by BenfoComplete.com, a vitamin supplement company that supports happy and healthy hands and feet for those with neuropathy. If you or anyone you know struggles with the pins and needles or numbness in their hands and feet, check out our Benfo teaming products at BenfoComplete.com and use the special code STANDUP for 5% discount on your purchase. Again, thanks everybody for being here with us today. Go to my website, thewomanbehindthesmile.com, for additional information and resources. Check out my YouTube channel and subscribe, and follow the replays of all of our great guests. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks very much for being here.